And here we go. This is a championship fight. This is MMA Fight Corner from the mecca of mixed martial arts, Las Vegas. Here are your hosts, Heidi Fang, Phil Devine, and Joey Varner. Hey, this is Mike Goldberg, voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and you are listening to the MMA Fight Corner. Here we go! Here we go! Welcome to the MMA Fight Corner, here on Sports 920 The Game, for your host, Joey Varner. Phil Devine and Heidi Fang. I'm Dave Carney, and guys, we're back in studio doing a web exclusive today from the Sports 920 studios here in Las Vegas and coming at you worldwide at MMAFightCorner.com. What an amazing weekend, guys. Big, big fights, a lot of different stuff. We had boxing, we had MMA, we had World Series of Fighting Five, which we are going to have to get Joey V's particularly unique view on. And of course, uh, we had some uh, we had some Bellator action. So lots of great stuff going on. And speaking of Bellator, as well as upcoming Lion Fight 11, September 20th, we are going to have Tito Ortiz on with us. Tito Ortiz going to be fighting in Bellator coming up in a few months. It's going to be a lot of fun having Tito on with us. So guys, welcome to the program. How's it going? It's going good. Real good. We have Christopher walking no, in the no, house. No, no, he started off. He started walking the walk, but then I, he stopped I didn't with even his talking. Mean, I didn't mean it to come out. It just, it just, it just his, kind of happens. His inner happens. walking just pops out. <laughs> wow. I like that. His inner walking just kind of popped out. Well, uh, don't Whoops. go walking away from the screen right now if you're watching us on a YouTube or a Ustream or wherever you could be catching this. Fellas, lady here behind the uh, behind the camera. She'll be getting behind the mic here in a second. Heidi. Whoop. What do you guys think of this uh, of this last weekend's just, I mean, massive fights uh, all the way around the world? I mean, it's especially starting with the one right here in Las Vegas. I mean, unbelievable pay-per-view gate. I think Floyd is set to make over $100 million from this fight when all is said and done. It just, it, it really, it shocks me that a one, one-off one fight can still bring this much attention, this much money. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit on Friday, which is, we you know, we strayed away from the MMA for a bit and talked boxing. And, you know, we knew it was going to be an... Um, a big fight, but we, I think we all agreed that it just wasn't Canelo's time. Just it's not, he's not ready yet. No, it, w- it was too much too soon for, for Canelo Alvarez. Um, had a year gone by, Floyd taken one or two more fights, Canelo gotten two more fights where he yeah. was sharp, he was more in his prime, he understood ring generalship, you know, he, he, he knew himself a little better, and Floyd slowed down just a split second, just enough, maybe. But I'll tell you what, though, I don't want to take anything away from Floyd because he looked brilliant, but you know who didn't look brilliant and who looked stupid and who looked like he had the worst game plan in the world and who looked like he's... Never looked before in his life. He's Oscar never fought Hoya. like this in his life. Oh. No, he was in rehab, so we didn't get to see. Well, him I was there. thinking he put together a horrible plan for putting him for us. Hey, hey, he, hey, hey, he, he was kicking back some cold ones and, and and doing little sniffy sniffy of the booger sugar. If you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think we do know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, but Canelo, he looked yeah. like shit. He, he's never looked like that. He wasn't aggressive. He came out waiting. He was trying to time a guy who's probably the quickest, slickest, fastest fighter of his generation. And he's waiting, waiting, waiting. The game plan to beat Floyd, I mean, anyone who's had any kind of success is to get in his face, relentless pressure, back him up. Don't let him time you. Don't, don't let him pot shot you. Don't let him start getting his rhythm where every time you throw one, he counters. You throw... Three, four jabs in his face, followed by four or five punches. He hits the ropes. You go to his body. You tie him up. You rinse, lather, and repeat. Right. I completely agree with you. And I was really upset that all we saw in the early stages there, and even later as the fight progressed, was the the counter game out of him. Like he, you're waiting on uh, to counter against Floyd. Do what's wrong with you? Get those uh, jabs. You're waiting working. to counter the king of yeah. counters. Well, here's here's the thing. I, I think that goes without saying. Obviously, Floyd unblemished record in professional boxing so nobody's been able to really come up like you said joey with that strategy and particularly make it effective against floyd mayweather i think the closest time i ever saw floyd even having much of a fight was against oscar de la hoya uh and with that being said i just here's the only thing i'd say about floyd and the same thing you could say about mike tyson too is that who did he really fight in the prime of his career now tyson oh, floyd 
Well, uh, you got to think about it. When he fought Ricky Hatton, Ricky Hatton was the was 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 the man. I mean, he was really yes. Uh, he just was because the man. HBO made that documentary about him, I no, he was he was sleeping people. I mean, he he the way he blasted Costa Zoo. I mean, he was. But see, if you le- if you if you look at the hype leading up to this fight, Canelo Alvarez was supposed to be the greatest challenger ever on record. So to me, it just I don't know. It's I guess always the greatest that, challenger that's, ever on record. That's that's the that's, that's the, the fight game, right? Fight. And well, that's what and Floyd does it better, better than, than anybody. Anyone. Absolutely, he makes you believe that his opponent is ready to be in there with him. He, he, he doesn't doesn't make you believe that right. because it, oh, it's, right. it's, it's the all-access countdown specials. They make you believe it. They sell them. But if you listen to what Floyd's saying during those specials, he's telling you, in all honesty, this dude doesn't blow no, the no, ring in me. No, at the moment, nobody, nobody does. does. Nobody does. And, and, and I that's, don't see anyone beating him. No, well, here's the thing, because the only guy, I, I think, in, in the modern annals of boxing that could have beaten him within his weight class would have been Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao may have given, no. may, and let me just say, may have given him a run for his money, because Floyd doesn't like fighting southpaws. Manny's a good southpaw with incredible punching power, and I think that's the one guy that scared Floyd enough to say, hey, listen, you know, take the TRT test or the HGH test or whatever <laughs> whatever he was kind of accusing Manny of taking before you get in the ring. Now, the fact that, that Manny and Bob Arum refuse to do that will always remain a mystery to me because that doesn't get a fight done. But that's the only legitimate contender, I thought, for Floyd. Well, what happened back then was he wanted to, I believe, use Olympic-style testing. Yes. And um, Manny, did. Manny, at one point earlier in his career, had this had done it and felt like crap. Get, having to get the blood drawn and just he so he didn't want to have to what was it I think it's the two days before or a day before the fight that's when they wanted to draw the blood and he felt so crappy he's like no nah, I, I can't do that again I'm not this is the this is the fight the world wants to see right if I'm gonna go in there I want to be in there on fight night at a hundred percent the last time I pulled this shit I wasn't a hundred percent well the funny thing with Floyd even calling all that out is because he's got a lot of shady stuff when it comes to his his post fight drug test as well uh, uh, with with Vado when they did the testing on him three separate occasions his his test came back flagged with a substance they didn't say what it was and what happens is you have a test a and a, a sample a and a sample B and when the sample a comes up flagged they retest the sample B right well in all three occasions they accidentally and intentionally disposed of sample B so they couldn't do a follow-up test. That's ridiculous. Now, and you don't... There's a great it. article if you uh, on Max Boxing and, and steroids and Vada and Margaret, Go- Margaret Goodman and, and, and the drug testing in boxing and, and how shady it really is when these outside organizations like, you know, George St. Pierre doing this whole Vada thing. That's that, shady. That's, that's a private company. This isn't like, hey, we're here to make sports better. This is, hey, we're here to make money. Absolutely. That's it. Well, and I think to a degree, the, Na- the Nevada State Athletic Commission and, and, and governing bodies all across the country, but specifically Nevada and what that has a tie to with the economics and the tourism industry here in the state, I, I don't know. To me, it's always been a little suspect, and, and really, that's why I think – the UFC is becoming so much more popular, though, as, as a promotion as opposed to boxing in general, because the UFC not only matches up great fighters against great fighters, so you won't get somebody dodging somebody for 35 years, but you also get a little bit, I think, a little bit more contained and well-controlled testing for whatever it's worth. And I, what I love about what the UFC does is even when they go you know, overseas, they still they do the test themselves. That's I right. Mean, I, I know a lot of people say things about Vitor Belfort, and I, I don't know enough about whether or not uh, Vitor fails or passes tests. But you know, listen, Chris Lieben was headlined the main event over there. It was the first five round fight main event, you know, non title main event. And he got popped for drugs, and the UFC caught him. There was no commission over there in England that caught him. Yeah, no, it's it's really I think. Just again, testament to the UFC and what they do as a company, as a promotion, to make sure uh, that they maintain the highest level of standards. And with that, guys, we maintain the highest level of standards right here on the MMA Fight Corner. One of the ways that we do that is give you guys, Joey, Heidi, Phil, a chance to give us your good, your bad, and your ugly in our newest themed segment, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Wicked winds were blowing in from the west, and Joey, Phil, and Heidi all had commentary on their favorite good, bad, and ugly from the weekend. 
Tuco likes big guys. The harder they fall, the more noise they make. Ay, <laughs> Dios mío. Well, all right, we're going to start off the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm just going to throw it to you guys. Give me each your goods, then we'll rotate back to the bads, uh, and then the ugly. Now, we're going to start over here uh, with Heidi. Ladies, go first in the good. What was the best thing you saw out of all the different fights we had going on this weekend? Mayweather. At 38 years old, he still looks awesome. I mean, his his jabs, his hooks, everything he was doing to generate any offense was making Canelo pay. He was just on another level, and Canelo unfortunately couldn't keep up with them. They both came in undefeated, but Canelo went home with the loss. Absolutely. All right, Phil, filthy. Uh, from the Bellator fuck was 90. your good? That from Bellator 99. <laughs> <laughs> Patricio Pitbull Friere, man, knocking out Diego Nunes in just a minute and 20 seconds to advance into the Bellator tournament. First off, Nunes had never been stopped before. First time. He had like 11 UFC fights. All of them went to decisions. Never been stopped. Pitbull goes in there and knocks him out in the first round. I want to see Pitbull in the UFC. Get that guy a contract. I know he says Bellator is his home, but I want to see him fighting the best fighters in the world. I need to see him in the UFC. Yeah, that's a stroke job. Bellator's his home. Yeah, wait till the UFC come call. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joey, you're up. You know what my good, and it's surprising, is my good is actually Andre Olovsky's chin. There you go. I mean, in, granted, he did fight a light heavyweight. When I say light heavyweight, I, I'm like a legitimate, you know, Forrest Griffin walks around at 240, Stephen Bonner 240. A lot of these light heavyweights walk around at the weight of heavyweight. My Kyle weighed in on fight day at 218. Yeah. But Kyle dropped him twice. Arlovsky, you know, this is the second fight in a row that he got dropped, that he actually survived, made it back to his feet, went to fight on. He showed that, hey, you know what, maybe his chin isn't as suspect as we are. Maybe his chin, it can take a licking, but he can keep on kicking. <laughs> as, as long as you're not a heavyweight. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right, let's uh, go over to you, Heidi. Uh, what was your bad? What was bad. Your bad weekend? I was actually really looking forward to the World Series of Fighting middleweight yeah. tournament. Unfortunately, we know from yeah. our yeah. guy Joey yeah. over there that uh, the Elvis Matapchik and uh, Jesse Taylor fight was canceled. And, uh, you know, I, I was just really looking forward to that. And it was due to some things Joey will talk about when we get to some yeah, of that. We'll, we'll be covering the whole WSOF 5 a little bit later on in detail. Don't think you're getting out of that one, Joey. <laughs> All right, Phil, here we go. Bad. My bad. Also from Bellator 99, Vladimir Machyshenko versus Houston Alexander. That was just a bad fight. That was a oh, and also Justin Bieber being in the ring. Oh God! <laughs> Thank you. What the hell was that All about? Right, Seriously. Okay. Seriously, uh, you we, know we, what? We've got what the fuck? Exactly. Bieber, that. Bieber walking out with Little Wayne. What the fuck is up with that? All right, listen. I'll, 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 all right, I'll tell you what. Once you get into the Hollywood Illuminati, Joey, you know this. Everybody gets a little bit weird, and I think they like Bieber because he looks enough like the little boy they want to fuck. That's why they bring him around. Oh. So uh, I think I'm going to go. See, when, if, when he first came out, I thought it was Miley Cyrus walking right, out a little Right, way. now, listen, now, if she Had came out, working, that, that's all right. You know, she can do her damn thing. All right, now, let's go over here. Ugly, let's wrap it up. We got half. Uh, uh, okay, bad. You didn't even give me a bad. I, I thought Bieber was the bad. bad. All right, go bad. Uh, he's, it's his bad. I just piggybacked his back because it was that bad. No, my bad is the game plan and the fighting execution of Canelo Alvarez. Oh, my God. Worst game plan in the history of boxing. He was thoroughly outclassed. By the end of the fight, he told himself he was beat. Okay, ugly, Heidi, we got 20 seconds. Hollis Gracie, Ric Flair flopping KO. Phil, Thank give you. me the woo! Woo! All right, Phil. Ugly. CJ Ross scoring oh, Canelo Jesus. and Alvarez. Yes. Raw. Uh, what, that, that Kill guy's, yourself. He's, a, he's the same guy that scored a fight for Pacquiao when Pacquiao got demolished and wiped up. All right, ugly. Ugly. The New Jersey State Athletic Commission's handling of that whole Elvis Mutop chick Jesse Taylor fight. My God, that was one of the ugliest displays of unorganized, organized athletic commissions I've ever seen in my life. Thank you. We got so much more to talk about WSOF and actually Bellator star Tito Ortiz, former five-time UFC defending light heavyweight champion and is now the manager of Chris Cyborg, who's going to be fighting in Lion Fight 11. Stay tuned to the MMA Fight Corner.
Corner. Mike Corner. On the all-new Sports 920. The game. The game. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here from the Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas and coming at you worldwide today at uh, MMAFightCorner.com. Maybe up on YouTube, maybe up on Ustream. Who knows where you're going to see this. It's on U- uh, Ustream now. It'll be on YouTube later. Sweet. All right. It will probably will never be on UJiz, but I might be on there later. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if it's on that and Pornhub.com, we know we've done something right. We're getting famous. Yeah, this baby. Is great. Look at it's, the way. It's no, no pants Tuesday. Oh, you know what I was going to say? The they're going to be like, these guys just mind fucked us, no. man. This has got to go on Pornhub, yeah. you know? We're the corner shot that keeps you from, go, you know, That's right. climax in Tuesday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, instead of think baseball, they're like, MMA fight corner, MMA fight corner. That's right. They, hey, well, listen. When you see some of the guys and gals in the MMA, you might not necessarily be so excited afterwards. It's one of those, you know, one of those things. The, the girls are all right. No, the girls, uh, you know, night games. You, okay, hold on, real quick. I missed. I, I wasn't here for Friday, so I didn't get to hear the recap right. of, of the. You uh, son the of a bitch! You're doing World Series of Fighting, which we got to talk about here uh, coming up in just a minute. By the but, way, but I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get to talk about the the episode of the Ultimate Fighter. No, you didn't. What do you think? She was awesome. Pena was awesome. She was just. She came out there. Look. Uh, uh, what's her name was so cocky. She don't belong Shana in the room. Shana really was so was. cocky, and uh, uh, Pena, Pena came out there with zero respect. We just and she cracked her in her mouth, and Baszler kind of she was like, "Holy shit, what am I in for?" Like this girl came to fight. Baszler had better technique everywhere, but less heart anywhere. I like uh, too how she had to mention that Sam Cecilia, one of her training partners back home, showed her all these takedowns and different ways to defend. You saw that in that fight. Absolutely, and okay. What's up, dude? Second episode of the season. Second time in a row. Rhonda, I'm a bitch, throwing a temper tantrum, crying. She's crying again. Two episodes straight, I, she's crying. I absolutely. First off. How ugly does she look on camera, but, but though, no, honestly? I, I, she, 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 I, she's don't so I don't think she looks ugly. I don't, I don't no, think no. she's a I, bitch. <laughs> I have you to don't? say. No, I don't. I, I, I think she's just a competitor at heart. And Phil, so, what are you going to say? No, she's, she's, she's just, a, she's just a strong woman. She is. All right. That's, that's up against a man's woman. World and it's tough out there. No, amen to that, brother. That's yes. right. <laughs> no, I, I but listen, see, she needs to tone that shit the fuck down. I no, listen. I see Ronda's game plan with the whole she's gonna be a move because you saw her say it. She's like, I'm gonna get in this girl's face every day. She's stepping over the line a bit. She's taking it a little too far. But I absolutely loved when she walked up to Misha Tate afterwards. She was like, You were smiling when my girl lost. <laughs> yeah, fucking kill you. I you thought know? that was the dumbest I, shit I there ever. Funny because as hell. she wasn't <laughs> smiling that your girl lost. She was smiling that her, her girl, girl won. Exactly. And then she tells you, she's like, "What are you talking about? Yeah. Shane is my friend." Yeah. And Ronda's like, "I wish I could take all the pain away from you and and have it for myself. I wish you could take your face away from me and have it for yourself. Get off camera, you fucking I guess, freak." I guess you're. I guess Joey. <laughs> Tell us how you really off, feel, Joey. I guess Joey's sick of seeing Ronda. I, I think so. He's got Ronda lash. I, Remember <laughs> Jerry Maguire? <laughs> Cush, cush. <laughs> <laughs> Who's coming with me? All right, I'm, I'm on. I'm on your side, Fangle. Well, listen, guys. I uh, want to say, Fangle. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Fangle? Hey, fangly this, fangly that. But don't fangle me for not saying our sponsors because today okay. we are brought to you on the web by Hangover Heaven, Vita Heaven LV. Of course, our friends, Dr. Burke, his staff, medical professionals, cure your hangover and also keep you feeling really bouncy like Joey Varner. Give him a call, 749-3300. If you're watching us online, you can open up a separate browser and go to hangoverheaven.com. That's hangoverheaven.com. Make yourself an appointment. Also brought to us by Brooks Brothers Bail Bonds, guy. Go to brooksbrothersbail.com, brooksbail.com. And check them out if you've got any problems with your uh, with your uh, actual incarceration needs, I should say. You know, get yourself out of trouble. I got family. You got family? <laughs> Give them Brooks Brothers Bail. And also Lion Fight Promotions, guys, bringing us Lion Fight 11 coming up this Friday, September 20th, live from the 3rd Street stage outside the D Hotel and Casino, downtown Las Vegas. This is going to be the first nationally televised fight from Fremont Street in history. Actually, one of the first nationally televised events ever from Fremont Street, but especially with fight. So big deal there. We're going to be out on Wednesday covering the weigh-in, little press conference. We're going to do a bunch of fun stuff with them all week long. And, of course, this Friday the fights start at about 5 o'clock with the uh, first undercards. With that, I want to bring out just, I mean, we're going to do some news later, Heidi. But let's talk about Chris Cyborg and her fight with Martina Jindrova, which is now, it's changed a bit. 
It has, and now she's been replaced. Martina Gendrova has been replaced by a French Muay Thai champion. This girl's undefeated. All her wins are by knockout. She's 10-0. and 0. Uh, She's going to really bring a fight, I think. I'm not exactly sure where her strength lies, if which of the eight limbs, but uh, being that she has 10 knockouts, I'm pretty certain that it'll be a good fight worth watching. So, you know, the opponent may have changed, but the game is still the same. That's right, and uh, an expected cyborg victory, I think, is still probably in the card. So if you're out there laying money, I mean, you never know, yeah, man. You, know you got a new contender all. who's who's ten and zero, and she's knocked out all ten of her opponents. This isn't mixed martial arts, you know. Uh, a cyborg's bull rush kind of, you know, blitzkrieg style might not fare as well I I in a Muay Thai fight as it does in the cage. Not at all. All right, well, so okay, valid points. I just happen to think that with these types of situations, You're bringing it, her in to lose a cyborg. Well, I, yeah, I don't think that that's going to happen. I, I think that's a lot like Floyd Mayweather picking a very uh, very green still at 42 fights, Canelo Alvarez. By the way, how does some guy get 42, 43 pro fights? and he's fighting at like 16. Yep. He started fighting at like 6, I think. Uh, fight, you, you, fight, in Mexico, fight. sure. Yeah, know. no, I you saw know, it. You know, it 16, and in, in, in boxing, you can fight that's twice true. a month early yeah, on. that's true. Mm -hmm. Fight this weekend, next weekend, you know. That's as true. As long as you take no damage and your hands are healthy. I mean, it's it's... It's doable. That's good. Well, you look like you're sticking and moving a little bit there in the sparring. You know, no, no swelling on the face today. I know you had to do that for TV. Uh, and let's talk about this a little bit uh, because we did have a big TV event, NBC Sports World Series of Fighting 5 uh, this weekend. Now, Joey, you're part of the World Series of Fighting crew. You do a great job with them. I mean, fantastic stuff again this weekend. But, you know, tell us a little bit about what happened. There's a couple of things going on. First, the middleweight tournament, like Heidi said, gets canceled. And now there's also some allegations about drug usage. Uh, the New Jersey Athletic Commission is changing stories. Bring us up to date on that. Well, well the, the, the tournament wasn't necessarily canceled. One of the, the matchups in the canceled, <coughs> one of the matchups in the tournament was postponed. And what happened was Jesse Taylor, Elvis Mutopchik are backstage, literally in the holding area, ready to walk out. I get a call over my IFE or my earpiece saying, yo, there's something going on. Get back there right now. There's uh, a representative of the athletic commission who's this like four foot eight, stocky, pissed off looking earringed all, all, all over her ears, mean mugging, mm. five foot high green mohawk. Sexy. With an attitude. And I'm like, uh, you know, hey, so what's what's the situation? And she's like, well, first, you need to step back. You need to take two steps back and get it. I mean, she was defensive from the start. You're like, yo, yo, Travis uh, Barker, relax. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I didn't even, bro, what? Big one of you two. What are you guys doing here? <laughs> yo, so, so then she starts saying that, She's witnessing uh, Elvis Mutopchik taking pills out of his pocket and popping them beforehand, which is against the rules. Mm -hmm. So then I go talk to Nick Lembo, who's saying uh, a different story, who said that, you know, there were some pills being passed around, handed out by someone backstage. Now, the story he's telling, <laughs> the, the story he's saying, he got from her. So then I went back to talk to her again, and, I, and I'm, I'm pointing at Elvis, and she's like, that's the guy you saw? And she's like... Listen, I'm not saying who I saw. I'm not saying who did what, but there were pills being taken, and that can't. So they didn't know. Their story changed the whole time. Now, here's the problem. Huh. You've got four people in your corner. All four of those people were the same height, same size, same kind of facial features, you know, roundish kind of faces. Yeah, exactly. the as exact him. same yeah. color hat with the exact same color shirt. Elvis Mutopchik's manager had a heart attack a year ago. He has heart medicine. He took his prescribed heart medicine. She saw that and went nuts. She wasn't sure about anything. She overreacted. And before she could, you know, make it an honest assessment, she started taking action. And it was overreaction and bad reaction. And it screwed them both out of, and out it of was a great fight. And based off an alleged, alleged. use it. Yeah, she, she was, But she wasn't sure who it was. You know, she was back talking. She was double stepping. She was defensive. She was aggressive. She was rude. She wasn't nice or friendly to work with the whole event. You know, well, she is, is she from New Jersey originally? Because, I mean, I know Phil, and he's, like he's from New York, New Jersey, and he's he's rather unpleasant most of the time as well. Phil, you, you, is this you something that you comes remember, from You don't remember Phil when he had his green mohawk. <laughs> I don't actually. No, you don't want to go back. To that. We don't want to. We don't want to have to relive that. I mean, you know. But listen here. What are your thoughts? Because Ray Sefo, after the after this occurred, he still paid the guys coming for for their for their show money. Okay. Obviously, couldn't get into bonuses. So, 
is he in a position now, you know, to, to have to, you know, come out and defend these guys? What do you think is the next step for the World Series of Fighting, and how do they rebound from this? Because this didn't look good on TV, I'm going to tell you. Well, first off, uh, big ups to Ray, big ups to the organization, because Elvis wasn't the one at fault. It was his manager who was at fault. And, and honestly, you're backstage before fights. You shouldn't be popping pills in front of uh, yeah, absolutely. A, 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 sure. an athletic commissioner. Whether they're prescription or not, you know, go to the bathroom, do it by yourself. It's just one of those things where it's such a gray area, and it's, it's something that really can trigger off a, a chain of events that led to exactly what happened. That being said, they both got paid. That's huge. Yeah, that's and on top of that, from what I understand, they're still trying to make that fight happen in October as part of the middleweight tournament. Okay. So okay. they're doing right by everyone involved. Okay, good. Well, and I guess that is, is one of the more important questions because, Phil, I mean, you you and I are talking a little bit over the weekend and on Friday and about, you know, World Series of Fighting and some of the other promotions. We had, obviously, Scott Kent in here, CEO and president of Lion Fight Promotions, which is coming up with Lion Fight 11, World Series of Fighting at number five right now. But we talk about the legitimacy of the promotions having a lot to do with management style and, and the way things get executed and how it's perceived by the public. Now, to me, again, I, I agree with you 100% that basically this was a, a comedy of errors. Unfortunately, one of the things that sets it off is what you said, and that is somebody doing a small thing like taking pills in front of an athletic commissioner, that's the, the, one of the simplest and most basic kinds of things you need to make sure is not it done. Was a it was a tic-tac. It was a tic-tac, I it's, swear. It's better than a search. You know what? Well, and there, was the, there was further problems, too, though, is because when the manager showed the pill bottle with the prescription, there were other kind of pills in the yeah, bottle. Yeah, that's not good but, either. But the problem was, though, <laughs> is that the other kind of pills, which you could look at them, and if you've ever taken any supplements, it was fish oil and vitamin C. And Molly. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you know what I mean? So if they're like, well, yeah, he's got a pill bottle, but he has other pills in there. It's like, okay, well, y you're carrying around supplements and prescription medicine. It does make sense that you put it in one one container. Yeah, and the whole thing was unfortunate. I really – we I had talked about the um, commercial uh, – yeah, we were about to go into a commercial, but uh, – I was talking about that fight the other day. I was hoping we would get to see it. Unfortunately, we didn't, but that's cool that they're going to make it happen in will, October. Man. Fingers crossed. Yeah, Elvis is a fun guy to watch, and you know we talked about Jesse Taylor, So, and it, the interesting style matchup, too. Dude, I feel like I'm a Jesse Taylor jinx because his last a couple fights before that, he was supposed to fight on my show, uh, Superior Cage Combat, and we're at the weigh-ins. His opponent, Terry Martin, shows up. The day of weigh-ins with a request for a TRT exemption with a note from his doctor. And on top of that, his levels on his blood test that he gave the commission were high. So he was too, so he was over level, so they had to cancel that fight then uh, as well. Well, guys, sounds like that was a full night of action right there for you. I don't know. To me, again, don't take pills in front of athletic commissioners of any kind. I don't care if you're in New Jersey or in Mississippi. Just kind of don't do it. We're going to take our next break here on the MMA Fight Corner. When we come back, we have got former UFC light heavyweight champion, one of the stars of the sport, and the guy that I talk about all the time getting me in to MMA, Tito Ortiz, with us here on the Fight Corner. Stay tuned. Sports 920, the game. 
All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner, broadcasting live from the Sports 920, the game studios here in Las Vegas. And, of course, coming at you worldwide at MMAFightCorner.com, where you streaming today. And a little bit later on this evening, we will be up on YouTube. Now, great recap there, Joey, with World Series of Fighting. And, again, I, I tell you, it's, for me, the most fun of the entire broadcast is getting to watch you in a dapper suit uh, do the things that you do best, which is uh, which is talk shit with fighters. You know what I mean? <laughs> do, your, do your knees hurt right now? Hey, stop that. This is You've been on them all morning in front of Joey. You know, Joey's just this good looking, okay? He doesn't know it. And, and, and really, the reason that got us all pumped up about this, guys, uh, we, we talked about him last Friday on the show. We had Scott Kent, CEO of Lion Fight Promotions, in here with us. Uh, Lion Fight 11, of course, is coming up this Friday, September 20th, on the Third Street stage outside of the D Hotel and Casino. And we were talking about one of the real forerunners of MMA fighting one of the first real superstars of the UFC and now the manager for Chris Cyborg who's going to be fighting a new opponent uh, this Friday and that of course is Tito Ortiz now Tito thank you so much for coming on to the MMA fight corner with us it's an honor and a privilege to have you with us uh, how are you today man Oh, great, man. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure. You've, you've got Joey Varner, Phil Devine, and Heidi Fang with you. Uh, Tito, first of all, I just want to start off by saying, you know, big fan. Uh, ever since we can go back to some of those PlayStation 2 UFC video games that you were the cover boy on back in, like, the late 90s, and, and I think it was you, it was Chuck Liddell, it was, it was some of these fighters that really set the sport in a whole new trajectory, and for that, we've got to thank you. I don't think we'd be doing a radio show if it weren't for guys like you in the sport. Thank you, man. You know, we put our uh, blood, sweat, and tears uh, in the cage to entertain the fans to go along with the greatest sport alive and make my hearts. Tito, I gotta say, man, I I, I love I love the moniker that you know the people's champ, you know, and, and I love that. But in my heart, in my heart of all hearts, where I watched you as an 18 year old amateur fight for free because you were still in college, smashing people in the pre Zuffa in the dark days of the UFC, you will always be the Huntington Beach bad boy. That's right. I agree. Thanks. <laughs> 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 you know, it just uh, helps me grow up, man. You know, I, I got three kids and. No, I don't want to be known as a bad boy forever. Oh, I grow up, I'm a man now, so, you know, I, I, I tread water a little light, lighter now and just um, make sure I make the right decisions and uh, not, not let my mouth do too much talk too fast. No, that's funny, though, thinking that you have kids and you're telling you when one of your kids is misbehaving and you're like, you're being a bad boy, and you're like, Dad, you are the bad boy. What are you saying? <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons. The changeover. Well, speaking of changeover, now you're besides continuing fighting, and you got that fight with Rampage coming up. But you're also managing, and you're you got a, a Chris Cyborg fighting this week with Lion Fight. Um, how is it now that the kind of the shoes on the other foot? You know, um, it, it's tough. It's still tough. Just not gonna make sure and make the right decisions for the future. I mean, I I've been doing it so much my own. Uh, as managing my own. Uh, you know, fight career, you know, just having an attorney, you know, to help negotiate the deals, of course, uh, but just finding the right people. It, it, it's difficult sometimes, but with Chris, it's really, really easy. The girl trains like no other. I mean, she trains seven days a week. She really doesn't take time, much time off at all, and she wants to fight. She wants to fight the best girls around. She's like, I don't care who it is, I'll fight. I mean, her opponent pulled out just last week, and she's like, I don't care who they give me. Just give me someone to fight. I don't care. I mean, she just wants to keep the ball rolling. You know, she dom uh, dominated her last fight by winning the uh, Invicta um, Championship. And she just, uh, like I said, was a pound for pound. Best one in the world, man, by far. I watch her spar. I watch her train with other people. We can't get girls to spar with her because it's too easy for her. We have to get guys to spar with her. That's, I mean, that's her training um, sessions. That's how it's been for the last uh, six months. So, Tito, is she actually training down at the Punishment Athletics uh, Training Center in uh, Long Beach, is it? Uh, Huntington Beach. Huntington yeah. Beach, okay. And what type of, I guess, m main training are you actually working on with her down there? Have you brought in, like, cruise Muay Thai master professionals, or is it just basic spar partners? What has she really done to get into that Muay Thai base? Well, I mean, right now, I mean, she comes from a Muay Thai bomb background for, like, with Shootbox. Uh, she continues to work with some of the guys at Shootbox. And for those, she's like, uh, you know, it, it's a lot easier because I don't have to do the jiu-jitsu and the wrestling together. Now I just have to focus on my running, um, lightweight training, and uh, Muay Thai. And let me tell you, when she's smart and she's hitting pads, it's like no other. And uh, you know, she's just picking it up. Her timing's perfect, and you know, we'll see you on Friday. 
Tito, now, now, now that she's out of Southern California, you know, one of the greatest women's fighters of all time, women's boxers, I think the greatest woman boxer there was, and one of the greatest, the greatest woman kickboxer of all time, Lucia Riker is based out, out of Southern California as well. Have you ever thought about putting them together, maybe bringing Lucia in for some sparring sessions or some, some additional coaching, just to sharpen her up, not just on that that traditional Muay Thai style, but, but that Dutch style that, that Lucia Riker has, has perfected? Um, that'd be amazing. I think it's just getting connections uh, with Lucia Riker. I haven't heard about her for at least 10 years. Uh, uh, that would be interesting. I would like to see that. I mean, we'd, we're always looking for new girls for uh, Chris to uh, spar with, and you know, they're hard to find. You know, uh, moving past this, this this Muay Thai fight this weekend, you know, uh, I remember when you first took over as her manager, you had a, a master plan you kind of laid out. And it was, you know, to come into Evicta to basically – conquer, you know, the women, the, the, her, her division over there, get the belt, destroy every opponent, and then have her move over to the UFC and set up some sort of super fight between her and Ronda, either at a catch weight um, or the weight was the issue. I, is that still the plan? And moving forward, if that is the plan, you know, how will you deal with the weight discrepancies? Well, you know, I'm, I think at this time, people want to see who's the best woman in, on the earth is, you know. People say it's Ronda. People say it's uh, Chris. The way uh, Chris has been dominating, uh, I believe, and the way I watch Chris, the way around it, she is as a fighter in mixed martial arts. I believe it. She's the top of town best girl in the world. You know, Ronda. To me, I mean, she's a great competitor. She's a great champion, of course, but she's on a bigger stage with UFC, so they can, you know, they can paint the picture the way they want it to make people believe something that may not be as true as I see in uh, Chris Cyborg. You know, um, people watch Chris Cyborg compete and dominate uh, time and time again. That's why I'm putting her in a kickboxing match. So how dangerous she is on her feet. And uh, she'll be fighting again, I believe, uh, in Victor. No date set, but we're looking towards uh, in November sometime or October. Any opponent? I know opponent yet. Um, it may be, uh, I believe, uh, the Edwin Gomez. That fight that was supposed to happen. You know, Edwin Gomez won her last fight in Victor. And she's really, really tough also. So, If you look at the direction right now of, I guess, Chris's career, would you say that you would want to continue putting her in both Muay Thai and MMA fights, mixing it up a little to keep her fresh all the time? Um, of course. You know, and uh, this is a question that she comes to me. It's like, you know, she goes, oh, I want to fight. I love fight Muay Thai because I'm able to punch and kick girls in the face and knock them out. Um, <laughs> but I like... I, I like uh, MMA because I can continue continue defending my world titles. People gotta understand, Chris Cyborg is like no other. She is a fighter. She she, she loves to fight. She's like Vanderlei. He was in his prime. But that's exactly how he's like. What about pro boxing? I mean, you know, uh, Heidi asked about you know comp- cross training and, and, and cross competing in both mixed martial arts and Muay Thai. You ever thought about throwing her in there and getting a pro boxing fight? How does no money to pro box for women? All the money's in MMA. Cross over there, man. Um, I mean, the Victor, we signed an amazing deal with the Victor, and she's making twice the money she would have made uh, signing an eight fight deal with UFC. Well, let me ask you something, uh, Tito, real quick, because you're talking about big deals being signed in. And for those that don't really know that you run the Primetime 360 Entertainment and Sports Business, which is uh, the company that has Chris Cyborg, who else do you guys have right now in your development ranks that you're really trying to bring out, or, or are you kind of focusing on, on Chris at the moment? Uh, well, right now we're just uh, focusing on Chris. Uh, you know, we're looking out for some of uh, some new guys. Is that a guy actually in Las Vegas who fights for tough enough? Um, I believe his name is uh, Mark Diaz. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 185 pounder. Yeah, and yeah he's a good, good he's fighter. Dominating it. Great fighter. I and mean, I watched his tapes. I met the guy. He's really nice. Um, bilingual, which is great for the uh, you know, Spanish audience. I mean, you got to attack for both sides of it. I mean, I'm good for marketing side. So um, we're most likely going to sign him next. Um, Another guy who's uh, actually be competing on the same uh, belt that I'll be competing on November 2nd, um, Bob Everson will be competing on the belt. You know what I mean? He's been fighting for a long time, but he's one of the trainers at my gym who's been helping Chris Cyborg for all of her fights. Um, I, just, I guess i got to kind of pick and choose the guys who want to manage the right way. So I just go out there and go sign all the guys that possibly can and try to get them fights. I want to get guys who want to work hard and become stars and 
think of it as a career, it's just not a hobby. You know, Tito, uh, in the sport of mixed martial arts, the, the promoters are so, you know, fight happy where they, they got a guy who's 3-0 and and they want to match him with another 3-0 and guy and they kind of want to make this big war happen. So you've got a lot of these top talented prospects coming up, but they're fighting the toughest fights of their lives early on in their career, whereas boxing is more about taking a young prospect with a lot of talent, grooming that talent, bringing him, harnessing his skills, bringing him up the right way where you give him a, a couple guys that, he, that are decent challenges that he should win, and then, you know, his fourth, fifth, fifth fight it's a real test and then you, a, a couple more challenges than a real test and when you mentioned you know you were looking at a, a fighter who's an amateur right now is are you going to kind of look towards with your management company going more the boxing route securing this talent right when they come out of the amateur ranks grooming them bringing them up so when they're 10 15 fights deep they've got a, a highlight real resume and they fought the best challenges and they're at the level of the top pros in their division Wow, I, I need to sign you with my uh, promotion company. <laughs> <laughs> that that you use to promote yourself and build fighters instead of crushing them. Yeah, that's, that's the problem with a lot of uh, big promotions. They they get fighters who you know three four zero. They put against other guys with three four zero. They don't get a chance to build. You got to build confidence. You got to build uh, you know the, their base, and that's what boxing has done, and that's how they make superstars. Well, I mean, you look at a lot of championship fighters. They become superstars because of their build, their fan following. And the fan base that watch them knock guys out and be like, oh, these guys are unstoppable, unstoppable, as they get better and as they mature and as they become better and better. Floyd Bay, the perfect example is his, his first 10, 12 fights, they took place in Michigan, in his backyard, where they created a brand, they brought in opponents that, you know, were semi-decent, but he was supposed to finish, and while he, while he was doing that, he's building his fan base, he's, he's, he's growing in his skill, he's getting the confidence, he's getting the knockouts, and then he's ready for that next step, that big stage. Well, that's what it becomes, you're building a brand of a fighter, instead of building a brand of a company. Now, in mixed martial arts, a lot of that problem is the companies are trying to build the brand of the company and not the fighters because they don't want the fighters to become better than the brand. And I think something like that needs to change. For fighters to make more money, that stuff needs to change. You know, fighters need to think about promoting themselves of uh, being big. You know, when I first started this, you know, I was the first fighter to come out of the clothing company. I was the first fighter to come out of fighter cards. I mean, I would do so much self-promotion because I understood the base behind that of uh, boxers would do the same thing. So why couldn't I do those same things? And as I started doing those, you know, I was I could be getting chopped at the blocks, chopped at the blocks. I mean, one of the reasons I went to Bellator because they had that same conversation with me. It was like, yeah, we want to help build. We want to help build these guys to become better and better and better. And they understand the business. Why would you want to build a fighter, become a superstar, if you're going to make money off them anyways? Was... I, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of questions there that, that need to be answered from other big promotions that need to fill those gaps and fill those voids. Well, speaking of Bellator, besides what brought you over there, um, this whole, we talked about Cyborg doing two sports, but what about you doing um, fighting and now you kind of dipping your toe in the water of professional wrestling? What's that been like? You know, it's been fun. I feel like a little kid out there, man. I'm, I've always been a huge fan of professional wrestling. You've got to understand, that's when I got into collegiate wrestling was because of professional wrestling. When I got into high school, I walked in the wrestling room going, where's the ring? I never really understood the <laughs> difference between them until I really started studying and understanding. You know, people say, oh, wrestling's fake. Yeah, it, it's fake from who's going to win or lose, but everything else, you're taking bumps, you're taking hits, you're taking slams. That's repetition stuff. It's, it's hard on the body. And hey, they got to act. Yeah, so well, it's... It, 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 Watching you right. and Rampage in there, that first, when you guys, um, I don't remember the exact night, but you guys came in and Rampage tried to throw him off the cage. Um, you, you're definitely, you look a lot crisper in there than Rampage does. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's just a lot of uh, watching as a kid. A lot of they just, I felt comfortable. I felt like, uh, felt like home. And then I had another chance I'm there sitting next to old Hogan. I mean, I mean. That guy's an icon. That's someone who I looked up hugely to. Well, I mean, doing both sports, I, I don't want any of my fans confused. You know, the fight that's after November 2nd that has nothing to do with wrestling, this is a fight. I'm fighting, I'm going to win, and I'm going to not pull any punches. You know, I'm going to throw elbows like no other. Uh, I'm going to fight. But the pro wrestling comes about, you know, that's the acting side of it. That's the stuff, you know, it's going to slowly transition into acting as I'm getting into acting classes already. You know, there's a... Um, the, the, the Bellator deal I signed, I signed a deal with a multi-passive deal. It wasn't just about fighting. It was about, it was 
about uh, the special wrestling, acting, doing um, acting classes, uh, my clothing company. So they offered me a deal that I think UFC should have helped me do a long time ago, and they never did. <laughs> Well, Tito, you've really been through it all in your career, and I'm just wondering, what do you find is the biggest challenge going in against Rampage? Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is, uh, you know, just be a little faster. It's not really a challenge. I think that it's just myself. I mean, I, I, I need to put myself in the positions that I've been put in with him. You've got to understand, me and Rampage had our first eight years together, you know, um, we know how we move. We know the moves we do. We, we know what we, what we do when we get hit and punched. Uh, we know the reactions we have. It hasn't changed for both of us for years. I think I've changed a little bit, and I think he's changed a little bit. But uh, it just, I think, comes down to whoever, whoever puts in the most work in for this fight during training is the one who's going to win the fight. Well, I tell you what, Tito, on that note, great one to leave us with. You are going to be fighting a Quentin Rampage Jackson, November 2nd, 2013, Bellator uh, 106. And I got to tell you again, what an honor to have you here on the MMA Fight Corner. Uh, really, thanks a lot for all your time today. And we can't wait to see Chris Cyborg out here Friday, September 20th at Lion Fight 11. Again, Tito Ortiz, thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you much, man. All my fans, I appreciate it. You want to see the baddest woman on, on this planet Earth? Watch on Friday night. You guys will see it. Excellent. All right take our last break here on the MMA Fight Corner. When we come back, we're going to break down a little this week in MMA history as well as get caught up on the latest MMA news right here on the MMA Fight Corner. MMA Fight Corner. Fight Corner. On the all new Sports 920. The game. The game. The game. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner, brought to you by Hangover Heaven and VitaHeavenLV.com. Dr. Jason Burke and his staff of medical professionals can cure your hangover. Seriously, 749. 749- 3300 or visit them online hangoverheaven.com and vitaheavenlv.com also brought to us by our friends over at brooks brothers bail bonds if you're having a hard time 
and maybe found yourself locked up over the weekend, you're going to need to get in touch with our friends over at Brooks Brothers Bail Bonds. They're military veterans, Las Vegas natives, and will take great care of you. Strict confidentiality. They have mobile services available. Visit them online at brooksbail.com. And, of course, Lion Fight Promotions and Lion Fight 11. Guys, coming up this Friday, September 20th, 3rd Street Stage, outside of the D on Access TV nationwide. Of course, we just had a great conversation with Tito Ortiz, five-time defending UFC light heavyweight championship uh, champion in his prime, now fighting uh, in Bellator 106 against Quentin Rampage Jackson, also the manager of Chris Cyborg, who we were lucky enough to get a piece of, of sound with a, a week and a half ago when she was uh, giving us a call here on the fight quarter. And it sounds like he's really excited about the new direction, guys, of his career coming from fighter, actor, uh, wrestling star, and now really in the management game. I think he finds himself at home. I, I think we needed more time. Yeah. I, I think you know, sure. they always have more time with Tito. Because there's so much you really need to ask him and so much that needs to be brought out. I mean, yeah, he seems like he's happy now, but why is he spe you know spewing all the hate still towards Dana? Like, uh, they're, they're really – I know there's hard feelings between the two of them, but, like – just why can't we all just get along? Well, wasn't Dana upset after a fight that he had? That he didn't like his performance in, and that was like what no, kind of no, you know? No, no, no. The last time, uh, they Tito retired. They were cool. Then and then Tito did the tweet. Might need to be, come out oh, of retirement. Yeah, blah, that's blah, right. That's blah, right. Tour, yeah. And then that's then right. Then yeah, set, 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 set it off. That's you know, right. But, yeah. not just, but not just that, Phil. Though is is I would have loved to spend some time going into the rampage Tito history because yep. they trained together for years. You know, you know what the other guy yep. does. They haven't changed that much as a fighter, you know? So, I mean, I would have loved to have got, you know, gotten some insights from him as to what experience he got from rampage, you know, how their training sessions and their sparring sessions went down. Cause yeah, rampage called um, big bear is home just as well as Tito did for quite a uh, few years. Hey, big shout out to big bear. Uh, <laughs> love that place. Great, great rampage is a there. big bear. Yeah, he is man. And I, I tell you what, Tito, hopefully uh, you can come like back. Power bottom. <laughs> Power bottom. Listen to this guy. It's a good thing we're on a web special over here because uh, I know I hope we get Tito back on uh, back on the show with us at some point because I'd love to talk to him about Bellator, about Cyborg, about the continuing evolution of uh, Primetime 360 Sports Entertainment. Good stuff there. Uh, we do have some MMA history coming up as well right now, guys, as a little bit of news with Heidi's Hit List. For the news from our reporter on the ground, it's time for Heidi's Hit List. Fox Sports 1 broke some huge news on Monday night. UFC officials confirmed that on December 14th, UFC on Fox 9, lightweight champion Anthony Pettis will defend his title for the first time against Josh Thompson. TJ Grant is uh, who was expected to face Pettis first. However, he's still suffering from concussion-like symptoms. UFC middleweight champion Chris Weidman and former champ Anderson Silva will visit seven cities in seven days to promote the pay-per-view match UFC 168. Uh, that will take place Saturday, December 28th at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. So fans, you can come down to the MGM on Tuesday, September 24th at 11 a.m. for a live and free press conference featuring Dana White, Chris Weidman, and also Anderson Silva. Also, we have a ton of fight signings. Those were recently announced in the past few days. First of all, UFC Fight Night 30 on October 29th in Manchester, England, announced Tom Watson is injured and out opposite Alessio Sakara. Replacing him is Swedish prospect Magnus Sedenblad. UFC Fight Night 31 slated for November 6th in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, they added a lightweight battle between UFC vet E. Fujitsu Master Edwards and up-and-comer Yancy Medeiros. UFC Fight Night 32 on November 9th in Golana, Brazil, has scheduled a welterweight tilt. Verbal agreements are in place for Joey's favorite guy, Brandon Thatch and Paulo Tiago. Uh, UFC Love one, that one. Yeah, Love right? three of those so far. Still some more, too. There's uh, <laughs> UFC 6167, Rafael Natal versus Ed Herman at the MGM, November 16th. UFC Fight Night 33, December 7th in Australia. Heavyweights Pat Berry, Soa Palele will clash. That was first reported by Australia's WAToday.com.au. World Series of Fighting 6 announced John Fitch's return. The Decagon will feature him versus Marcel Alfaya. That will be on October 26th in Florida. 
Bellator MMA will also premiere a weekly web series that's called Bellator MMA Uncut that begins Tuesday, September 17th. The web series will look at all the behind-the-scenes footage from the fights and the previous week's fights. Make sure to check that out. Sweet. Now, Heidi, I've got to ask you, uh, last time Anderson Silva was promised on these big whirlwind multi-city uh, press tours, he didn't really feel the need to show up, didn't go oh. to L.A. What do you kind of bet that this time Dana's like, hey, guess what, bud? No missing the press events. I don't even think it's that. I think now it's going to come down to pride. He wants that rematch. He's hungry to get that belt back. He misses his baby, and that's called gold, the yeah, gold strap. I, I, so he'll be there. Can, can I just backtrack a little bit? And I really need to get your guys' take on this. Um, you mentioned the John Fitch fight, you know, and, and where it would take place. Mm -hmm. The Decagon. What do you guys think about that? It sounds. I think I guess if it has ten sides, technically you have to call it that. But that's just my Asian nerd. But I mean, yes. no, it's, like it's right. Does, <laughs> does, does call it a cage. A cage. cage. The Bellator. I mean, there's only one organization that has branded the the shape of their uh, competition area as the octagon. And well, now it's RFA too. They have permission to use it. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but, but, but I mean, yeah. octagon. But it's, that's it. yeah, but it's the octagon. And I right. think that's you know, that's that's uh, a lot of thanks for PR person. I mean. Every single. I week. remember IFL before they closed. They wanted to do the six-sided ring. Yeah. I mean. Hey, you know what I have to say about like the the six-sided ring gone. L listen, here's, <laughs> what, here, here's what I have to say about six-sided rings. It's a hexagon. Okay, it's a hexagon. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Local? Listen, you that stuff it. is Bro, ridiculous. You man. cannot <laughs> drop that intro <laughs> without letting that beat play, bro. Oh, I you didn't hook him up with the beat. I cut some stuff. I didn't hook up the beat. You bait. cannot drop that <laughs> info without <laughs> the bubbles coming that's, after That's right. Well, listen, guys, you know what? I, I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to direct everybody uh, to the MMAFightCorner.com for part of this week in MMA history. Phil, uh, the intro is almost too long for us to even get through. Break us down just a couple of things that we're going to see on the website here uh, for this week in MMA History Part 1, because we went a little bit long with Tito. Great stuff with him, though. Fantastic interview. Uh, well, this, on today's day, maybe five, yeah, five years ago, back in 2008, Nate Diaz took a split decision over Josh Neer in a pretty good back-and-forth fight that took home fight of the night. Uh, it was fight night 15, and it was a 10-fight card that was leading into season 8 of The Ultimate Fighter. also has one of the most finishes on any card. I believe the first seven fights ended by, didn't even go past the second round. And then, uh, that's a very nice picture, Joey. And then the, uh, the, um, the last three actually ended in a decision. But UFC 11 also went down on September 20th, 1996. And Mark Coleman won his second UFC tournament in a row when he defeated Julian Sanchez in the quarterfinals and Brian Johnston in the semifinals. No other competitors were fit to go on that night, so Coleman won by default. One interesting note from that tournament was Tank Abbott was finally allowed back to return to the UFC for this event after his famous altercation with Elaine McCarthy at UFC 8 in Puerto Rico. And if you don't know about that, oh, God, look it up. It's quite entertaining. Tank wasn't allowed to fight in the UFC for a few, uh, <laughs> for a few months after that. <laughs> but that night, Tank defeated Sam Adkins in the quarterfinals and lost a decision to Scott Ferroza as an alternate in the semifinals. Feroza was sent to the hospital after the fight due to hydration, and he couldn't continue, so Coleman had no one to face in the finals. So what did they do? What did they do to fill some time? Mark Coleman went in there with Kevin Randleman and put on a, rex a wrestling exhibition, suplexing him around the octagon for a couple of minutes to please the fans in the audience. All right, listen, I'm going to tell you what right here. You know, we had little Tito on. He, he wants to be a wrestler for a little bit. Wrestlers want to be MMA stars. Just ask, uh, ask Brock Ledsner. You know, it worked out okay for him for a little while. Quite a few have. Quite, quite a few. All right, guys. Joey, we got a rap. We're going, bud. Speaking of rap, Speaking no, I was going to say, boxers want to be rappers. Uh, right. Adrian Brody on tour with Little Weezy. That's Looks right. fat as hell, talking smack about MMA, mm. and thinks he's a rapper. All right, but guys. I'm the more dapper rapper, and if I see you, I'm a slapper. Nice. I like that. This guy's got a future in more than just the MMA fight corner. Until we hear you next time, bye-bye.